the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the thing about parables is that usually there's a key point for us to focus on. Something surprising, unexpected, that reveals to us a new truth about God or about communion with God, which is kind of meant by that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The problem, however, for us is that the particular parable that we have today, we probably get surprised by the wrong things. It seems fine that a king is giving a feast for his son's wedding and inviting all the kind of important landowners, that kind of thing. But then for us, it it gets weird. Why would the landowners maltreat and kill the king's messengers? And next, why would the king indiscriminately burn their entire towns, presumably killing not just the murderous landowners, but all kinds of innocent people. Is this really Jesus teaching us about the Father, that he is a kind of vengeful maniac? Remember, I don't know if you remember about Saddam Hussein, how he gassed whole towns of Kurds just because a few of them were posing a threat to him. I don't think so. I think these violent details, um, they just, for the original audience, they would have formed a kind of unsurprising uninteresting piece of background information. Sometimes emissaries of kings were killed, especially if the king's power wasn't secure. Or again, if the landowners wanted to make it clear that they did not support uh, this particular son as being the heir. You know? Remember, that's the context. The king seems to be inviting the landowners to be present at the wedding of his son, presumably as a sign that they accept this succession plan. And by killing the messengers, they make it very clear they don't, uh, they don't. And probably they are planning for themselves a different successor than the one the king has in mind, this son. And given that context, the enraged king no wonder, uh, no wonder, because the king is so angry and seems like such a furious character, in a way it's no wonder that the landowners aren't too happy about his son being the heir. Uh, and so they want to neutralise, um, so the king then wants to neutralise the threats that they pose to him by obliterating them. So for Jesus' audience, that kind of scenario wasn't actually that shocking or surprising. There's plenty of instances like that in the history of the Roman Empire, and even this guy Herod, Herod the Great. He had a lot of family members killed who were who were threatening his power position. Um, Angry rulers, vengeful, rebellious locals that need to be put down, uh, locals that might take the power from the king for themselves. For a first-century audience, that kind of stuff was just a background setting. The surprising and shocking element of the parable is meant to be what comes next. The furious and vengeful king, instead of just enjoying um, the destruction of his enemies and maybe having a smaller wedding feast, he makes a bizarre decision to tell his servants, okay, anyone that wants to come to the wedding, anyone who's willing to take my son as the successor and heir, Let them come, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're residents or foreigners, indeed, whether they are good or bad. The invitation must be extended to all of them. They are welcome at the royal feast. And this would have been shocking. Paupers, peasants, beggars, thieves, liars, scoundrels, they are invited to the royal palace into communion with this kingdom, irrespective of any status or being deserving of an invite. This is the shocking aspect of the parable. And this is the point Jesus wants his audience to take home about the nature of his kingdom, the church. Entry and membership will not be based on race, 
or economic status, or even if you have like a clean criminal record and all the points on your driving license. Entry is based solely on accepting God's gracious invitation to you. His gracious invitation for you to have Jesus as the heir, as the successor, as the one who will be Lord of your life, your sovereign, your king. And all the other stuff about you can be forgiven and overlooked with this declaration of loyalty and obedience, which sacramentally, that happens in baptism, or if you've been baptised, it can happen by making a good confession. Those are the moments in which essentially you put your life under Christ's authority. So that's kind of the focal point of the first part of the parable. Not so much this whole, this whole kind of um, violent scene, which was just typical, which was just typical of, of how kings dealt with threats in the ancient world. And I don't think it's endorsing that way of a king responding at all, by any means. That was just to be kind of taken for granted. That's how kings work. They want to keep things under control. They want to secure the succession of their heir. The point we're meant to focus on is that now the invitation uh, into this kingdom is being extended so radically. And the only condition is one of accepting the invitation, accepting this uh, heir or to the throne. But then the second part of the parable, it um, kind of adds a tiny bit more of a nuance because whilst God's invitation and mercy is radically extended to all who will receive it, regardless of who they are and what they've done, there are conditions to remaining in the kingdom. It entails living a certain way, wearing the wedding garment. That is, living according to your new dignity as a member of the kingdom. You know, some people say, and I don't know how true this is, and I don't know if anyone knows how true it is, but some people say that at these occasions, kings used to provide the garments so that if someone turned up not wearing the garment, it wasn't just you know, they didn't have a garment. It was that they had chosen not to bring the garment with them that the king had provided. Um, so it was a kind of provocative and proud disobedience to be there without the wedding garment. But regardless of that's true or not, regardless if the king provided the wedding garment or if it's just an expectation... Look, if you're going to, going to a wedding, you put on your best clothes. It's reminding us that whilst we are graciously and mercifully called by God into the kingdom, once, you are, once you've accepted that invitation, um, we actually owe him in return um, total generosity. We owe him... Uh, we owe him the living out of a new kind of life. So whilst the good and the bad were all invited to the, to, the, to the wedding feast, the actual scene of the wedding feast is showing us that there's been a kind of conversion and that regardless of what they were like beforehand, within the context of the wedding feast, they've become new creations. They've put on this wedding garment but then there's this one person who has cast off the wedding garment, who didn't bring the wedding garment. Um, and that's the situation of someone who, I suppose, finds him or herself having maybe converted to the faith and embraced the faith, but then at some point has got complacent. They're in the church, they come into Mass, they seem to be present, but they've lost this wedding garment. Often in um, Catholic literature, you hear the phrase, the garment of grace, you know, robed in the garment of grace. And that's how most Catholic uh, commentators will interpret this particular wedding garment. Um, 
that, that once you have entered the church, once you've been baptised or gone to confession, you're clothed in the state of grace. Like you think about a baptism when the baby puts on the white garment. Clothed in, in the grace of being a friend, friend of God. The parable is warning us that, that entry into the kingdom isn't sufficient. You know, in, receiving and accepting the invitation is fantastic. And God's mercifully extending that, that out to everybody. But once you've accepted it, um, with great love and gratitude to the God who's called you into the kingdom, you've got to try and live a certain way. You've got to live in a way that keeps that wedding garment pristine by a life of daily prayer, of getting uh, kind of nipping sins in the bud so you don't enter into the state of mortal sin, so you don't lose that wedding garment, um, so that you can basically enjoy the wedding feast because sin although it may seem uh, to the other the other way it may seem to the contrary sin doesn't enable you to enjoy the wedding feast um, even if you think it's going to enable you to get more out of life um, sin excludes you from the wedding feast mortal sin excludes you from the wedding feast so each one of us with great gratitude of being called by god each day has to have a look at the, the kind of brightness of the wedding garment, of the garment of grace, to ensure that its beauty is not fading. And if it is, uh, to do something about it, so we don't end up thrown out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.